We're now moving on to session one, the big six in logistics in 2023. Please welcome Rob O'Byrne, the founder and chief executive officer of Logistics Bureau. Thank you very much. Um, it was amazing uh, looking through the list of people who are on board here. I'm feeling very old because I know half the people here. So uh, welcome to Kathy, Ann, Maria, Steve, Mark, Eric, Kevin, and, and everyone else that I've known for a while. Uh, let me just share my screen now and we'll get things going. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, so I'm the CEO uh, and founder of Logistics Bureau, where I guess what you call a pure play consulting company, uh, primarily working in the logistics field, but the broader supply chain as well. And what I wanted to share with you today is what are we working on right now? Uh, we're very lucky in that we get to work with hundreds of businesses every year, probably about 200 different client assignments all over the world. And it gives us a really good indication of what people are working on, what people need help with. And those are the things I wanna share with you today. What I wanna talk about is the, the big six things that uh, really people are focused on. And, and let's kind of understand here for a moment what we're trying to do. Most supply chains are trying to improve service and cost. We want high service, low cost. And fundamentally it's about let's get enough product closer to the customer and try and do that at minimal cost. What a lot of people get distracted about is the tech and the robotics and all the other cool stuff that's happening in our industry. I don't, I don't want to sort of go against that. You know, sustainability and stuff like that's really important and we all need to focus on that. But sometimes I feel like the, there's almost two industries within our, in our industry. Uh, there's the rich kids on one side of the track and, and they're trying to work out what the latest vacuum cleaner is that they should buy. And then there's the poor kids who are the majority on the other side of the track and they're just trying to sweep the rubbish off the floor. Um, and so what I'm going to share with you over the next 30 minutes or so is what most people are focusing on, why they're focusing on it and the sort of benefits that they're gaining from it. So if we think about the idea of we've got to have the right stuff close enough to our customers uh, and try to minimize the costs. Most people are focusing on three things, inventory, transport, and warehousing. Now we could have this diagram with 20 things on it, but this is what most people are focusing on. And in terms of inventory, what they're looking at is trying to improve the inventory health. And I'll be talking about each of these in, in a moment. Uh, the right balance of inventory across their network, not carrying too much slob stock and so on. This is a critical one always, trying to balance this service and cost equation. And that's been really tricky over the last couple of years because we've been trying to maintain service through a period of uh, you know, volatile resupply, um, and that's been pushing our costs up. Uh, and then planning is another key component. On the warehousing front, uh, it's, it's about location, always has been in terms of where do we deploy our inventory? How many warehouses do we have around the network? Uh, it's about our capacity in our warehousing, and it's about productivity, of course. And this is where, for a lot of businesses, uh, you know, automation, robotics and stuff can have real benefit. On the transport side, it fundamentally comes down a lot of the time to trying to make sure we're getting the right rates and costs. And I'll give you a few tips there on a moment. Uh, it's about the utilization of our transport office uh, our assets. And it's about the fleet makeup, where, where we have our own uh, transport fleets, particularly delivery fleets, have we got the right mix of vehicles there? So I'll call the things not on the, this list, the enablers. So, you know, this is the, the bots and it's the tech and all the rest of it. But the key stuff is here. This is what people are working on. Uh, now, I'm going to share a little bit of an insider secret here because I had the team look back over uh, the assignments that we've done this year, as I mentioned, a couple of hundred a year. Um, and what are we being asked to help on? So this is right from the coalface. 17% of our work is related to warehousing. And I'm going to go down into each of these in, in detail in a moment and show you the sorts of things that we're working on. What are people trying to cope with there? They're, they're running out of space. They've got high costs. They're, they're trying to outsource warehousing. That's the sort of stuff that they're going through. Outsourcing itself, there's been a lot of activity this year. It's getting harder and harder, and I'll explain why that is. Freight is particularly problematic. Uh, we, we've had freight companies disappear, uh, consolidation in the industry. We've got fuel levies, high costs. So that's a particular challenge. Inventory is always a challenge. Uh, profitability 
uh, of our customers and our products is always a challenge. We've been working on that a lot and fleet, op fleet optimization for those uh, who are managing their own fleets. That's not to say that people haven't been focused on other things. Um, of course they have. Uh, you know, getting their strategies right, training their staff, as was mentioned in the last session, in terms of other, you know, getting their strategies right and getting their uh, systems deployed correctly and so on. But the big six are these, the warehousing, the outsourcing, the freight, the inventory, profitability, and fleet optimizations. So that's really what I'm going to share more on today. Now, um, I'm probably going to annoy Sharon by saying this, but uh, if you have any questions going through this, do please uh, type them into the chat box. And if we don't get to them all, uh, what I'm going to do is ask Sharon to send me those questions and I'll put a video together and we'll share that on the Supply Chain Partners website in the coming days. Uh, I'd love to get lots of questions and, and sort of understand what people are facing in terms of challenges. Okay, so what's happening? What uh, what are people struggling with in warehousing particularly? Um, probably the main one is capacity. Um, particularly over the last couple of years where we've increased inventory levels, a lot of businesses have seen a huge growth in their business um, and they're just you know, straining at the seams in warehouses. Uh, I've had clients call me over the last couple of years fairly regularly to say, can you find us a warehouse in Melbourne, Sydney? Warehousing space is at a premium. It's very expensive now, probably double the cost that it was just a couple of years ago. Um, and so people are in the first instance thinking they have to go to a larger facility or outsource somehow to get that added capacity. Not always, I would say. Um, <clears throat> we've helped a lot of clients recently actually improve the capacity and efficiency of their existing warehouses. Uh, now, those who know warehousing on the call, you're probably going to guess what I'm going to talk about. Things like aisle widths. And I'll tell you about a, a, a customer recently who managed to get really huge increases in their capacity. You know, if you've been around warehousing for a while, you walk into a warehouse and you kind of get a sense of how efficient it is. You, you, you just know walking around it. And I know some of you on this call uh, would certainly understand that. Um, and a particular client that we worked with recently would go in there, walk around the warehouse, and I was just amazed at the width of the aisles. Uh, they'd obviously uh, laid out this warehouse in a period where it wasn't particularly high volumes. Uh, they figured it was easy to operate with nice wide aisles. Uh, I think the aisles were almost four meters uh, using counterbalance forklifts. So a really simple solution for them rather than, and they were considering moving, rather than moving or outsourcing their warehouse was just to start shuffling the, the racking. And literally over a period of weekends, they, they would, you know, empty one rack, they'd, they'd move it and then refill it with product. And then the next weekend, they'd empty this rack and move it and then come back and fill the product. And I think over about six weeks, they kind of shuffled up and, and got about three more rows of racking in and they got 30% more capacity. The aisles, I think, came down to about 1.8 meters. And the reason they could do that is that they were using articulated forklifts. Really cool. You know how those bendy buses operate? Um, literally like that. So they can have a much tighter turning circle. They can turn into the pallets, but in a much tighter way. And they've got about another five years life out of their warehouse. So in terms of capacity, it's not always the case that we have to move, we have to find a bigger warehouse. Our, our first port of call is always, how can we reorganize that warehouse, relay it, make it more efficient so that you can get more life out of it? And a lot of companies have been able to do that. You know, depending on the operation, this, this one we're looking at is a fairly typical uh, warehouse uh, with racking, I think it was about six or seven high. Depending on the operation, it might be lower racking, you can put in mezzanines and that type of thing. Uh, that'll always help as well. Of course, we shouldn't forget that if we're running out of warehouse space, what we need to look at is inventory uh, and how much slob stock, slow and obsolete stock are we carrying? Um, so a lot of a lot of our clients have been doing that. Um, and another really good technique to have a go at is slotting. If you've never come across slotting before, it's a process of analyzing your product uh, volumes and throughputs and working out the most efficient place to put that product in your warehouse. I, I liken it to uh, putting stuff in your fridge. If you open your fridge door, the milk and the eggs and things are in the, on the door shelves for a reason, because we go there a lot and they're easy to get. 
It's exactly the same in your warehouse. You know, we've got uh, where's receiving and dispatch over here. All of our fast moving lines probably ought to be near receiving and dispatch. So if we said those are the A's and then this is very simplistic. There's the B's, there's the C's. You know, that's what a lot of people are doing to, to maximize efficiency at the warehouse. So it's around capacity, it's around efficiency. Um, and there's you know a lot of things that people are working on there. I'll just add one little pointer here, and uh, I'm terrible at drawing a bar chart, but if you can imagine there are different functions within the warehouse, um, and we're allocating labor to those different functions in the warehouse, I would just, if you're running warehouses, just have a think for a moment about four particular functions in your warehouse. And that is receiving, put away in storage, picking, and packing. Because what we found over the years is that 60% of your labor cost is generally absorbed across those four functions. Receiving, put away in storage, picking, packing. Uh, and whenever we're designing warehouses, we always look at those activities to try and make them as efficient as possible. And that's quite often where bits, you know, bits of automation and so on can be well justified. Okay, so number one was warehousing. Number two, outsourcing. Oh, Everybody is wanting to change providers or uh, outsource an existing facility. Um, generally, it's because of uh, capacity or dissatisfaction with their current providers. Um, it can be lack of space. It can be costs going up. It can be very often poor service from their, their existing providers. Uh, and they come to us and say, look, we're not, we're not happy. Take us, guide us through an outsourcing process, um, you know, help us select an appropriate service provider. The biggest mistake that every people make with that is time. It is getting harder and harder to find good warehousing and freight partners, and it's taking longer. Uh, the reason for that is the rationalization in the industry, the shortage of resources amongst those companies. And to be honest, a lot of them are getting very, very picky. So if you're going through an outsourcing process, you've really got to make yourself look like an attractive customer. Um, I, I know it used to be a, a buyer's market, not so much now. Um, warehousing, particularly uh, 3PLs, are being very picky about the clients that they take on. Um, we had one earlier in this year. Um, we couldn't find anybody who wanted to take on their business. And that was because they weren't a very attractive customer. Uh, they had a lot of specific demands and, and quite niggly demands, to be honest. Um, and, you know, a lot of the 3PLs looked at that and went, nah, too hard. Why, why would we bother? So a little bit of a tip there. If you want to go through a really smooth outsourcing part, uh, uh, outsourcing process and find some really good partners, make yourself an attractive partner. Don't be too demanding. Clean up your own house first. Make sure that the, you know, the activities are fairly easily outsourced and so on. Time is the critical one. Um, we are now telling people, you know, if you're going to move, say, from one warehouse to another one, uh, and it's an existing facility, allow at least six to nine months to go through that process of selecting a 3PL. It can take that long. We've even got to the extent now where one particular client quite recently was saying, we're not sure whether we ought to expand our own warehousing or outsource because the, the shape of their business was changing a little bit, their storage requirements were changing. Uh, and they said, we're, we're hearing on the market that you know maybe it's going to be very difficult to find some 3PL warehousing. So rather than go through that whole process, we said to them, look, let's just test the market. Um, and we've done this quite a bit recently where we'll start to ring around a, three, a few 3PLs without naming names. You know, Would you be interested in this sort of product? you know, 12,000 12, square meters of warehousing or whatever, just to test the market. Um, and so we're, we're putting in extra steps there, I guess, to guide the, uh, guide people through the process. Um, in terms of outsourcing freight, it's it's a similar story. Um, and one of the one of the biggest challenges there that people face, again, is kind of making yourself uh, an attractive customer to the freight companies. But we're we're having to face excess charges due through you know, lack of drivers, lack of vehicles. It takes about two years now to get new vehicles into a fleet. Um, and one of the things that, that people get caught by is their freight profile. Let me just draw a very simple diagram here. 
if you looked at the distribution of your load size, let's say your uh, average load size was 10 tons or 10 pallets, and this is up to you know 22 as a full truck and five here. Uh, people don't understand the sort of rate structures within transport. Um, and very often they'll be very happy because they've got a fantastic full truckload rate, but they're actually traveling less than truckload at 10 pallets. So when you're looking at rate structures, make sure that what looks like an attractive rate structure is attractive for your weight breaks. Uh, number three, freight. We've touched on a couple of things there. Um, one thing I would just say is present your freight in such a way that it is easy to handle. Uh, far too many companies think this is great. We're just going to palletize this stuff. We'll have it at dispatch and ready for the car ready for the carrier to pick up. Uh, but is it easy to handle? Can it be double stacked? Does it have to go on a mezzanine deck? Um, you know, you can actually make your operation easier to handle for 3PLs, for carriers and so on. So do have a look at that because all of that leads to excess cost. And one of the things um, when people are looking at outsourcing freight, which I try to get them to avoid, is don't cherry pick rates very often people will go to the market and, and they'll get a, a bunch of bids in from different carriers and they'll say oh this is a really good rate from sydney to melbourne and, and melbourne and brisbane we'll use them for that and then we'll use this carrier for another one cherry picking like that very often doesn't work because a lot of freight companies will be putting a package together for you based on the all of the business on offer uh, and they will, to a degree, cross-subsidize across different lanes. So cherry-picking very often doesn't work. If it does work in the short term, it's generally not sustainable. And the other thing is, get a good opinion on the rates that you have already. We've had some clients come to us recently where they've said, oh, you know, our freight costs are going through the roof. We, we really want to sort of test the market or we want to go through an RFT process. And we look at the rates and we say, those are pretty darn good. Be very careful. <laughs> you know, you, you go to the market, you may end up with the same company, but at higher rates. So check around. You, if you think you've got high costs, maybe you haven't. It's really worth checking around. Okay, continuing the gallop through. Inventory is another big one that people are focusing on. Why? Because they're running out of space in their warehouses, uh, because they've got huge, in, huge investment in inventory. Um, and really what people are trying to do at the moment is to balance the inventory across the network with the ABCs uh, and also across that, that inventory profile. It's tricky in some industries. Um, we do a lot of work in mining and utilities and uh, anyone who's worked in that sector, you'll know that inventory management is really hard in those sectors. Um, you'll be carrying could be 20, 30% of your inventory as insurance spares, you know, really expensive um, bits of equipment, uh, motors and gearboxes and things, which you have to have because you can't stop the mine operating. And so inventory management in those, in those um, industries can be quite tricky. You've got the other end of the scale where you might have FMCG, uh, you know, we're selling baked beans and rice and things like that. And relatively, you know, it's easy to forecast those products. Uh, the resupply is, is not uh, too bad and it's much, much easier to balance that inventory. Uh, but some of the things that you need to be looking at there is how you're deploying the inventory across the network. Um, what's your forecasting like? What's your forecasting accuracy like? Um, and again, that's easier in some industries than others. So don't beat yourself up over it. Uh, recently talking to some mining companies again, they have real challenges in that, you know, there can be a bad weather event and suddenly the materials that they need go through the roof. Um, you know, there can be something that occurs with breakdowns and suddenly they need a lot more stuff than they had planned to. So the the forecasting, the demand planning is, is very much industry based and you need to be able to, to focus on that making sure that you get your forecast accuracy right, getting your slob stock down. And inventory accuracy is a really important one. Uh, a lot of people are particularly poor at this. If we can't get our inventory accuracy right, how can we expect to get our inventory levels right? Uh, I should just explain this chart, what we're looking at. And most people are familiar with ABC of inventory. Um, this is just an example of how we generally take this a step further. And we do ABC by SKU and then ABC by order line as well. So this kind of gives us the double A's, 
uh, and this is the double C's. It's just a further classification of inventory to make sure that we've got the right amount of stock. Number five, ah, one of my favorites. Um, I feel like I'm banging my head against the wall sometimes, but you know, people are still asking for help to understand their customer and product profitability. Uh, for those of us in the industry, we very often call that cost to serve. Um, I used to preach that the thing that really increased your cost to serve significantly was small orders. Small customers, small orders um, really made it very difficult to make those orders profitable. Uh, and I generally said that about what well, most companies have about 10% of their orders as being negative margin. I've seen as much as 80%, believe it or not. 80% uh, of orders going out the door with negative margin. You wonder, well, how could that possibly be? Um, a lot of it is because traditional reporting systems don't allow you to lift the hood and kind of see what's going on. Uh, but generally, it's about 10% are losing money, about 20% are break even. Uh, we get 60% profitable, and then we get about 10% of our orders being highly profitable. Uh, and of course, getting this stuff right helps us get profit certainty. So I would normally say the easiest way to fix this is have a look at your small orders and your small customers. Increase order size, use incentives to, to do that, and immediately your cost to serve will start to drop and you'll see increased profitability on an order by order basis. I'm starting to see a shift. Um, and, and that fundamentally, because of this lack of visibility of, of profitability across a business by SKU and by customer, I'm starting to see the big customers as being the non-profitable ones. I've seen this in a few companies this year. Imagine, for example, you have a business where 50% of your volume goes to one customer, and then you discover you're not making any margin on that customer. 30, 40%, 50% going to one customer, and it's a loss maker. That's pretty shocking. And, I, and I've seen that a couple of times this year. So don't think for a moment um, that it's necessarily the small customers and the small orders. So well worth having a look at. Uh, what's happened with, with those guys that we've worked with this year, they've used that information to go to those customers, of course, and say, I'm sorry, we're going to have to put up our prices. We're going to have to put up our rates. Uh, this is why it's not sustainable. And of course, it was all being masked by the other customers, the other orders, which were highly profitable. So we've got to lift the hood on that and look at it. Um, the sixth area that has been most in demand this year has been fleet optimization. And in a couple of areas, one is sort of fleet size and mix. Uh, so for companies that are operating their own fleets, they very often have a fleet that's grown up over time and there'll be you know large, mid, smaller size vehicles for specific tasks. Depending on the industry and the business, that, that can make utilizing that fleet well quite difficult uh, if you've got you know, different types and sizes. Uh, and so a lot of people are looking at their fleet mix and, and trying to rebalance that to maximize utilization. Um, and if you, have, if you have a very uh, sort of high density delivery operation, uh, I'm thinking now like sort of bread and milk deliveries. Um, what I've got down below here is a little example of the traveling salesman algorithm, if you like. Um, and bread and milk companies really understand this and, and trying to make their, their delivery fleets efficient. They understand that there's a, a stem drive, if you like, to the first customer. And then there's a cost associated with delivering to that customer. There's a fixed cost and variable cost, depending on the order size. And then there's like this interdrop distance with a cost and then there's a cost associated with the next customer and so on and so on what some companies fail to do is that they will look at that delivery route and say this delivery route costs us x you know two thousand dollars or whatever that's okay they're not looking at it by uh, as a customer by customer basis and understanding the profitability and they're not using a system to plan those routes to make it as efficient as possible I've done a lot of work with sort of bread and milk companies and you might go out and do 50 or 60 deliveries. That is really hard to make that an efficient delivery route off the top of your head. So this is where a lot of people use you know, routing systems to, to help with that. And that can be really effective. So fleet optimization is certainly something that people are looking at. 
what we're trying to do, of course, it's, I always think it's like running an airline. We want to get 24 seven utilization if we can. Um, and we want to get capacity utilization as high as, so volume and time. That's really what it's all about. Um, and the biggest tip to try and make these operations much more efficient is time windows. And when we're helping clients make their delivery operations more efficient, that's generally where the prize is. So imagine this one will only take deliveries between 6 and 7 a.m. If we can stretch that a little bit to 6 to 8 a.m., it allows our planning systems much more flexibility to, to make that a much more efficient route. So there we go, the top six that I've been seeing over the last 12 months, uh, not made up, literally looking at what have we been asked over the last 12 months to help people with. Those are the six standouts. It's people trying to improve their warehouse capacity and productivity, um, going to the market for, for better warehousing and freight contracts. <clears throat> They're tr reviewing their existing freight contracts. They're balancing the inventory. They're trying to make every single order that goes out into the market profitable and they're trying to make their fleets more efficient so my question to would you question to you is have you got those ones under control and coming back to the poor kids on one side of the track and the rich kids on the other side of the track that is not to say that robotics and automation and tech and so on is not important i guess what i'm saying to you is don't feel under an enormous amount of pressure that you're not looking at these things uh, seriously enough and trying to introduce them into your company if it's the fundamentals that you're really struggling with, and most people are just trying to sweep the floor, not do it with the latest vacuum cleaner. Okay, there we go. That's the six. We've probably got time for a couple of questions, Sharon. Uh, probably one question. That's all right. I'll stop sharing. So, <laughs> Well, I've got a question for you, Rob. That was absolutely brilliant. So thank you very much for that. Which one would you see as the highest priority? Oh, wow. Look, it really depends on, on uh, the business performance and where they're feeling the pain. If I was going to pick one of those, it would be understanding uh, profitability at an order level, because that really opens up then, um, you know, visibility of a lot of other problems. It's a tough call, though. I, I'm, as I said that, I was thinking about inventory. If your inventory management isn't good, that could be a good place to start as well. Really depends on the business. Yes, absolutely. Well, that was absolutely brilliant. I loved how you did everything in your presentation and you made it very educational, entertaining and informative. And you've educated us about those six areas and I'm sure we have all learned something new. <laughs> so thank you very much, Rob. My pleasure. Nice to see lots of old friends on the call. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Rob. Mm -hmm.